Well, Minister, Director General, Commissioner, High Commissioners, Ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a warm welcome to Old Parliament House for this panel on advancing women in business and leadership in the Pacific, hosted by the Lowy Institute and the Foundation for Development Cooperation. I'm Michael Fully Love, Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathering this evening, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. May I also say how beautiful it is to see so many Pacific faces here in Old Parliament House. I know there are a lot of Pacific community leaders who've come here this evening from Sydney, from other parts of Australia, from overseas, to be a part of this discussion. So a special thank you for coming so far. We really appreciate it. Tonight, we'll be celebrating the strong and successful women leaders in the Pacific. And of course, it couldn't be better timed because there are a number of important meetings in the Pacific coming up. The Pacific Leaders meeting later this month, Chogham in Samoa, the first time I think the Minister mentioned that Chogham has been held in the Pacific. And gender equality will be a priority at both of those meetings. So we're kicking the discussion off at the right time. This evening's event is supported by the Foundation for Development Cooperation. The FDC, which was founded by Bill Taylor 35 years ago, has long argued for a more inclusive financial system for the poor across Asia and the Pacific. The FDC will be wrapping up its operations in the next few months, but it leaves behind a powerful legacy. In recent years, for example, FDC has supported an annual Lowy Institute Pacific Lecture given in the past year in this very room by the Prime Ministers of Samoa and Fiji, as well as a fellowship to enable the Institute to bring talented Pacific Islanders to work with us as researchers at our headquarters in Sydney. And I'm delighted that as the FDC winds down its activities in coming months, the board has decided to continue its support of our Pacific Lectures and the FDC Pacific Fellowship. So I'd like to thank the board of the FDC led by Anne-Marie O'Keefe, and its director, Stephen Taylor, for their support of the Lowy Institute. Let me tell you how this evening will proceed. We have a fabulous panel to come featuring experts from Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Samoa and Australia on the topic of advancing gender equality in the Pacific Islands. But first, to give some introductory remarks, it's my pleasure to call on Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong. Penny is very well known to this audience. She's one of our most senior, experienced and effective ministers, serving previously as Minister for Climate Change, Minister for Finance, and since 2022 as Australia's top diplomat and as leader of the government in the Senate. One of the features of Minister Wong's time in office has been a laser-like focus on the Pacific and on Southeast Asia, um, visiting every Pacific island country, every ASEAN country except Myanmar, Penny is everywhere. It's a very familiar experience for me to be somewhere in the world and to meet an official or a think tank head and say that they have just seen Penny in their country. She has just returned from, uh, from uh, Suva, where she met with Pacific Island Forum Foreign Ministers, and from Washington, where she participated in the OSMIN 2 plus 2 meetings with the Americans. So we're really grateful to you, Penny, for making time at the end of a busy sitting day to introduce tonight's event. Minister. Uh, thanks very much, Michael, for that kind introduction. And I start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and paying my respects to elders past and present and acknowledging their continuing custodianship of country. Michael just said, very good of you to meet, uh, come down here at the end of a sitting day. I wish it was the end of a sitting day. <laughs> I was um, I, I want to make some comments first, if I may, about uh, the FDC Foundation for Development Cooperation and, and LOE and thank them, uh, not only for hosting tonight, uh, and I'll come to tonight, but for their uh, focus uh, on the Pacific, uh, on the lectures that Michael spoke of. It is so important that we as a country gain uh, a, a wider and deeper understanding of the region in which we live. Uh, and there have always been people in Australia who have understood and worked closely with um, uh, Pacific, the Pacific, uh, but certainly uh, I believe we need to make sure 
we broaden uh, the Australians, the number of Australians and the number, frankly, of Australian parliamentarians uh, who have a deeper understanding of, of the aspirations uh, uh, and dynamics of the region in which we live. So thank you for contributing to that. Uh, and I acknowledge there are quite a lot of dignitaries uh, here tonight, so my acknowledgement of <clears throat> any MPs and senators who I can't see without my glasses on, um, uh, um, but also members of the Diplomatic Corps, the AFP, and, and, and also um, uh, to Kerry Hartland and others, thank you for being here and thank you for the work you do. Uh, may I also acknowledge Dr Jessica Collins, who's the Research Fellow uh, in the Pacific Islands Program at Lowy, um, who's built up a serious body of work on gender in the Pacific and Pacific diasporas in Australia. But most importantly, I want to acknowledge three leading Pacific women who are speaking here this e evening. Leilani Burns from Fiji. Just got back from your country, I did. Um, Dr Fiona Hukula from PNG, Papua New Guinea, and Luau Donina Vaha of Samoa, which of course is led by um, uh, one of the most impressive leaders that I've met, um, Prime Minister Fiame Naomi Mata'afa, who also has spoken here um, previously. Um, may I also acknowledge our uh, fantastic ambassador for gender equality, uh, Stephanie Copas campbell and thank you for your um, tireless efforts in the Pacific, not only in this role, but over many years. Uh, and if I may, I've just noticed who's sitting next to you, the former Chief of the Defence Force, <laughs> um, uh, General Campbell, who uh, has also been such an important part of Australia's engagement with the Pacific and really models respectful um, and empowering engagement uh, as a leader uh, with Pacific Island nations. So thank you for your work. Um, the three women who I reference from the Pacific are from, from Fiji, from Papua New Guinea, from Samoa, um, I think are reasons for optimism. Examples of the impact dedicated, hardworking women can have on the world around them, on their communities, uh, and for gender equality. And there are many challenges advancing uh, to, to advancing women in leadership. But I did want to start tonight, instead of talking immediately about challenges, to do a little bit of celebration. Um, celebrating some of the leading women in the region and the differences they make. So Leilani Burns will be intimately familiar with the remarkable journey of the Fijian women's national rugby team and the Fiji Fijiana Drua, which have put women's sports up in lights. Uh, breaking cultural norms and breaking sporting records. Uh, in Nandi, I heard firsthand the challenges these women faced as they pursued a career in the sport they love. And I also heard and saw the impact their success has had on women and girls in Fiji, on the sporting field and off, inspiring greater acts of courage and fortitude. And I acknowledge the achievements of women in the political space as well, women like Kesi Sawang and Rufina Peter. At their election, Papua New Guinea was one of only three countries without a woman member of parliament. There had not been a woman in parliament between 2017 and 2022. And I met with them in 2022 and we talked about what they had done uh, and what more we could do to overcome the barriers that women representatives face. So I'm pretty pleased to say there's now a third woman Member of Parliament in Papua New Guinea after Francesca Samosa's by-election victory. These women and others like them are applying their leadership skills to protect and lift up their communities. But while we need to celebrate success, we also need to face the challenges that stand in the way of others following in their footsteps. Many of the challenges in our region disproportionately affect women and girls. Economic pressures, rising rates of hunger, complications from the digital transition, climate change, increased natural disasters, threats to peace and security. And then of course, there is the blight of gender-based violence. Around the world, one in three women have experienced gender-based violence. In the Pacific, that number is two in three. Think of the impact that has on individuals, on families, 
on communities and actually on the nation. On top of all of this, the COVID-19 pandemic saw a generational loss of gender equality gains and that has not yet been reversed. Apart from being the right thing to do, gender equality is good for our societies and it's good for our economies. When women and girls are empowered and barriers to their participation are removed, economies grow faster and health and education outcomes improve. Just by narrowing the gender gap in workforce participation, developing countries can add 8% to their GDP. And investing in gender equality is an investment in better peace and security. What we know from our experience and from the evidence around the world and here in the Pacific, gender equality is a predictor of peace, even more so than a state's wealth or political system. So at the same time as the Albanese government works towards gender equality at home through our national gender equality strategy, Working for Women, we've also sought to take major steps to advance gender equality in the work we do in the world. Gender equality is central to our international development policy launched just over a year ago. That policy reinstated the requirement for 80% of Australia's development investments to incorporate gender equality. And it introduced a new requirement for investments over $3 million to consider women and girls. What does that mean? Well, as an example, it means that when the government builds or invests in building a market in the Pacific, that we ensure it is safe and inclusive for women stallholders. So it's a pretty reasonable place to start by counting women in. And I'm glad to see that Pacific leaders have also focused on this, as demonstrated by their Gender Equality Declaration last year, which acknowledges women's economic empowerment is fundamental to development. Fundamental to development. Of course, the task, as always, is to move from declaration to reality. Uh, and there are uh, more than a few insights in this room on how to make that happen. So I commend Lowy and the Foundation for Development and Cooperation for convening this event. I acknowledge the panellists and leaders uh, who are here, and I genuinely look forward uh, to your ideas as we work together to advance gender equality in our region. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Minister, and uh, we know you may, be, may not be able to stay for all of the event because you've got to go back and complete the sitting day that I rather hopefully <laughs> said was complete. Uh, but thank you for making time. Um, let me now welcome to the stage in a minute um, the fabulous panel that Penny mentioned, Lailani Burns, Donina Va'a, Fiona Hukula and Stephanie Copas campbell but they're going to be properly introduced by my colleague, Dr Jessica Collins. Jess is Director of the Australia PNG Network at the Institute. She's done very important work in recent years on remittances, on economic sustainability and other topics. Um, she'll be leaving us soon because, as many of you know, a couple of months ago, Jess won pre-selection for the Senate for the New South Wales Liberal Party. So this won't be the last time you will hear Jess Collins asking questions in Parliament House. So let me welcome Jess and the fabulous panel to the stage. Well, thank you so much, Minister and Michael, for setting the scene with those important remarks on this uh, profound uh, issue uh, for women in the Pacific. But here we have uh, some amazing Pacific powerhouse women. Uh, we have Stephanie Copas Campbell, the Ambassador for Gender Equality uh, uh, for Australia. And we're going to hear about their inspiring stories and about what really drives economic empowerment uh, in the Pacific. So, First up, we are going to hear from Stephanie Copas Campbell AM. Uh, she's currently Australia's ambassador for gender equality. The ambassador has extensive experience working across the Pacific, 
in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, including in Papua New Guinea, Fiji and Tuvalu. Uh, she's worked across public, private, philanthropic and community sectors. And she's also the founding director on the board of, PN of Family PNG, providing services to survivors of family and sexual violence. She's also been battling a joey today. On her, her side gig is uh, caring for wildlife, and uh, that's been her, her gig for this afternoon. We also have Dr. Fiona Hukula. She's a policy advisor at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, uh, the former senior fellow at the National Research Institute in Papua New Guinea, uh, and program leader for Building Safe Communities and former deputy chair of the PNG Constitutional and Law Reform Commission. Next up, we have Luau Donina Va'a, the CEO for the Samoan Ministry for Women, uh, Community and Social Development. You're a leader in Pacific Early Childhood Development and chair of the Pacific Women's Professional and Business Network here in Australia. And I should point out that Luau is her chiefly title that was bestowed upon her uh, by her extended family because of all of her achieve achievements throughout her life. Leilani Burns, awarded Westpac Manager of the Year for Women's Best Business Executive, host of the first Fijians Women's Sports Show, a journalist and commentator, this is a redacted version, by the way, <laughs> and a National Rugby Union player. I think you're the captain of the Fijiana, the Women's Fiji Rugby Union team, absolute superstar. And I bet you're looking forward to the Women's Rugby World Cup here in Australia in 2029. Can't wait, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> we're hoping, we were discussing this before, we're hoping it's going to have the same impact that the Women's uh, Soccer World Cup did as well. So look out for it, not too many years to go. So there's a huge amount of expertise and knowledge on, the, on this stage. Uh, and we really want to focus on the positive stories for women because we want, to, we want you to walk out of here inspired and ready to pick up that laundry list of things to do just to keep that momentum going on this important issue. So Ambassador, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I'm going to ask you, if I may, if you can set the scene a little bit on the work that you're doing uh, in the region on your gender equality strategy, uh, but also ask you to reflect on why business and leadership is so essential to the progress of women in the Pacific. And just to give a little bit of context, a report from the Asian Development Bank has just been released. There's some really good news in there. Uh, we saw that um, the, for the second time, Regional averages for Pacific women and business leadership have surpassed <coughs> global averages for the second time. And the numbers of women and business leadership positions keep going up and up in the Pacific, which is great news. So in your view, why is this momentum so important? Why is it so important to have women in business and leadership? Okay, well, thank you. A number of us just got back from the Republic of Marshall Islands and I was reminded of this fantastic um, saying there, which is all protocols observed. So you're all very important. Observe you all. I will acknowledge that we're on Nambaria and none will land and pay my respects to elders past and present, but all protocols observed. I did think about more than protocols in RMI, and indeed it was a fantastic opportunity um, to hear from Pacific leaders on their priorities for gender equality. And not so surprising, the, the list was. Um, targeted, um, gender-based violence was on top of the list and as a cross-cutting issue across everything that we're trying to do. We talked about getting more women into parliament and why that's so important, improving health outcomes, um, unequal care burden for women and ensuring that women have equal economic opportunities and then the disproportional effects of climate change on women and addressing those. All of these challenges resonated with me because they're all also challenges for women here in Australia. And therefore, our work in the region is really guided by priorities of Pacific leaders. External solutions to problems that we identify externally never, ever work. So we are committed in our work to working through regional and government leadership under their strategies and their priorities, enabling civil society to do what civil society does best, which is work with their communities to identify problems and come up with their solutions, contributing to skills development and absolutely ensuring that we are coordinating our efforts in our partnerships, um, that we are efficient, evidence-based and accountable to outcomes. So that's a bit about our strategy. But turning to business and leadership, I was reflecting 
as um, I was thinking about my remarks on Family PNG and the NGO that I'm involved in, we have recently started a social impact coffee business where we're buying coffee from women growers. And as we sell that coffee, and it's absolutely delicious, you can get it at Ainsley shops, you can get it online, try it, it's amazing. Um, but 100% of our profit goes to our case management and safe health services in PNG. When we were looking at which communities we worked with and which businesses and women growers we worked with, um, I went with John Colley, the, the High Commissioner here in Australia, who's our patron. We went up to communities in the Highlands and we sat down and we met with the community. We met with men in the community and separately with women. And the men told us their priorities and their priorities were better roads, they wanted some livestock, they were um, pretty keen on, on some capacity building and wanted some machinery. And all those things were important. When we sat down with women, they thought those things were pretty important too. But they were thinking about their kids. They were thinking about education. They were thinking about healthcare. They were thinking of get, getting their coffee safely to market without being attacked along the way and without being done over by the buyer who would try to take advantage of them because they were women. And so if we were only listening to the men in this and in everything that we do, you're only getting half the picture. You're not understanding the needs of an entire community. And women think about these things and apply these perspectives in all that they do through this lived experience. It informs how they set up businesses and run them. It informs the financial decisions that they make. And indeed, we know that women typically invest 90% of their earnings in family and communities, where men, it's about 30 to 40%. It explains why my kids always come to me for money and not my husband. <laughs> um, they, they tackle loans differently and tend to have much better repayment of loans. That diversity of thinking is so essential for running a business. Um, for being on a board and what you are considering as part of those board decisions. Um, and just one more quick story on that. I'm, I'm on a board in Papua New Guinea. And as we brought more women on there, our decisions on our board shifted. Um, we were recently, it's a, it's a board that looks after um, supermarkets, hardware stores. And we were recently considering why we were losing some customers out to some competition. And the men in our board were saying, we need a better meat section. That's going to bring in more customers. And the women on the board said, Who's doing the shopping? And at what time are they coming in? Hmm, it's women, about three o'clock after school, and they have their kids. Now, when we go shopping with our kids, our kids are wanting this lolly and this treat and these toys and this aisle. And we reckon if we get that into the, the shopping experience, you're going to get more women coming in and our profit's going to go up. And guess what? It worked. So bringing those perspectives to everything that we do absolutely makes sense. And it's why your question, why are women in, in business, women in leadership roles, why is it important for women? Well, it's not just important for women, it's absolutely important for everyone. Thank you, Ambassador. Dr. Fiona Hakula, we're gonna to turn to you now. Um, we heard from uh, Minister Wong before uh, that women's economic empowerment is fundamental to development. Now that's part of the, uh, that, that's, that de that's part of the Pacific Leaders Gender Equality Declaration. You've been working on the revitalization of that declaration. And in the, in the revitalized declaration, you recognize that Pacific countries must create environments conducive to women's economic empowerment. So what does this look like? Thank you. Thank you. And um, firstly, thanks for the invitation to be here. And it's so good to see so many familiar faces here tonight. And, uh, one talks and friends. Um, so in terms of what, what economic, uh, what this looks like um, as framed by the Revitalized Pacific Leaders Gender Equality Declaration or PLEDGE, um, which is the acronym um, for the declaration. I think, again, coming back to your earlier point about um, starting on a positive, you know, a lot of times the, the discourse around gender equality in our re region is um, at a deficit, we always start on the we have low, um, got the high, lowest levels of uh, political representation and high levels of violence. We recognize that. In the declaration and the co commitment towards um, economic empowerment of women 
is a reflection of um, our member states, including Australia and New Zealand, meaning that we undertook um, uh, robust consultations to come up with this declaration. And so what it looks like is really supporting what, what's already there. So um, the scale of women's economic empowerment, I think, is quite broad given the region. We've got some very big countries like my own where there's, I don't know, 17 million people. And then we've got small countries um, with a few thousand people, which means that the opportunities for women to engage in economic empowerment in business is, is different. And so it's supporting women in the private sector in leadership roles. It's supporting women who are MSMEs. Um, it's also supporting women in the informal economy because we also know that not every uh, woman, woman who's in the informal economy wants to advance to be in the more formal space. And also, I think it's really important to consider the banking sort of situations in all of our countries. Um, some of our our member countries have issues around correspondent banking. And so while we want to encourage women um, to, to be in the, info, uh, in the econ working in the economy, whether it's in the private sector, in the government, or running their own businesses, there are wider sort of considerations. And so really it's about supporting all of those different levels. And we know that across the region, from PNG right up to RMI, there are um, a lot of work, there's a lot of work going on already. Um, and so it's really, as I've mentioned, supporting where we can and really working in the context that um, our women are living in um, every day. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Now, Donina, we're going to turn to you. You've had a couple of really big wins in the policy space. You're working for the Minister for Women. I uh, would really love to hear what's happening in Samoa. Also love to hear whether having, uh, you know, your Prime Minister, Fiamé, you know, she's, she's, um, she's a formidable uh, leader and she certainly uh, advocates for gender equality. So does that help uh, shift the needle on this important issue? Uh, and does that help bring the Samoan men along the way too? Thank you. I think the men come anyways, but... Um... <laughs> Um, first, I'd like to pay my um, deep respects for the Aboriginal elders, um, the past, present, and emerging, whose wisdom um, continues to strengthen us and guide us. And as I sit here, um, I'm reminded of the journey that has brought us together, the challenges faced, the victories won, and the doors opened by those who believed in us. Samoa's wins are reflected in the updated legislations, uh, the leadership milestones, and the district development project. And I know a lot would like to know more about that. So Samoa so has advanced quite, um, you know, gender equality since establishing the Ministry for Women, Community, and Social Development, including ratifying the CDOR and the updated Labor and Employment Relations Act 2023 to ensure workplace gender equality. We've also strengthened rights, um, national policy on gender equality, uh, 2021 to 2031, bolstering women's legal um, protections. And future legislations like um, the Child Protection Bill being reviewed currently, as well as the ECD framework, the pending endorsements by cabinet will further empower girls and boys in the hope that they too will be sitting here, not talking about this because guess what? Gender equality has been achieved, but that, um, they'll be talking innovative things. Our leadership milestones, um, the Honourable Fiamme Naomi Mata'afa made history as Samoa's first female prime minister and he is leading the way for gender equality. Under her leadership, uh, Samoa appointed the first Pacific female minister of finance. And I'm very happy to say that I'm sharing this historical um, um, space where women now hold Wait for it. 56.7% of senior executive roles in the public sector. Wow. Mm. It is wow indeed. 33% of board director positions and make up 22% of registered Matai chiefs, including myself. But I just wanted to mention that um, progress in gender equality enhances, not diminishes, our roles as nurturers and homemakers. Now, the district development um, project. Everyone wanted to hear a little bit about that. 
At the recent um, 8th um, Pacific Women's Ministers uh, meeting, Minister Mulipola shared a powerful metaphor about connectivity, likening it to Wi-Fi. And she said, do you have Wi-Fi? We're always asking, do you have Wi-Fi? But said instead that the Wi-Fi should actually be the heart. The connection we should seek is from the heart, as it is through a genuine connection that transformation does occur. So the heartbeat of change in Samoa, the district development project, the true essence of change comes from the heart. And the heart of Samoa are its people. Change can only occur when everyone is on board, and that is the driving force behind the district development project. So the district development project is um, decentralization of um, community funds, one million tala to each of the 51 districts. Um, these uh, funds uh, to establish offices that's already been done and they have um, staff as well as collaborate on projects to address the unique the uniqueness needs of each community. To date, um, in the last month, um, 139 projects have been um, um, completed, benefiting over 53,000 households across the country. The success is intertwined with Samoa's Fa Samoa, its faith, culture, and traditional village setup. Uh, these elements um, signal that United inspires the communities to come together, enabling collaboration essential for the program's um, success. And they're supported by the ministry, as well as the CSO's partners, um, in building the capacity and um, resources for impactful decision making. The big win, this is the big win we're talking about, the groundbreaking decision. Two months ago, the District Development Project Steering Committee made a historic commitment, dedicating 20% of its funds specifically to gender equality projects in each of these 51 districts. This decision has now been endorsed by the Cabinet last Wednesday, placing gender equality at the very heart of Samoa's development agenda. Samoa is certainly setting a powerful example of community-driven transformation. And yes, this is under female um, leadership. So she certainly has um, shifted the needle and the hearts of the people of Samoa. Faftai. And Donina, am I right in saying that, you know, mostly uh, the uh, men on the decision-making board of this and they unanimous, unanimously approved it, which is absolutely terrific. So it's a really big win and congratulations. Thank you. Leilani, your success in the sporting career uh, arena in media and business is a great story and we heard from the minister that it's a story of courage. So we would really love to hear how you did it and what lessons can be shared um, so that, you know, we can get more women kicking goals like you have. Thank you. First and foremost, I just want to say thank you. A big Vanaka Vaka level to be able to be here amongst you all today and to also be up here on stage with our inspiring panelists as well. Um, thank you for your question. Um, for myself, what I attribute my success to in both sports and also my professional career wholeheartedly has to be the supportive, conducive environment in which I was raised. This really enabled me the opportunity to excel and to be able to push the barriers of what was socially acceptable for my gender. As we all know, across the Pacific, traditionally, it's a patriarchal society. And women and men have specific gender roles and activities, which is what they're allowed or socially accepted allowable to do. Now, this is taught to us from home, but my household was extremely different. Growing up, my parents instilled within us that regardless of your gender, your religion, your sexual orientation, that we are all equal. And so with this in mind, we grew up with the, uh, with the mindset that we as sons and daughters are able to get out there and achieve anything that we put our mind to as long as we work hard to be able to do it. So growing up in my household, there was no separation in terms of chores for the boys and chores for the girls. The boys would get out there and do the cooking and cleaning just alongside us girls, and we would be out there chopping the grass or heading out to building sites and helping my dad lift up ceilings and walls in his day-to-day -day job. Now, this upbringing really taught me something. First and foremost, it was about respect, respect for others, 
And it also gave me the confidence to be able to go out there and to strive and push the envelope, so to speak, and cross into different activities that was generally allowable just for the boys, which is moving into managerial roles or leadership positions and also playing rugby, which in Fiji, as everyone knows, it was always seen as a male sport. Now, being the daughter of a former NRL player, I wanted nothing better than to strap on my rugby boots and follow in my dad's footsteps out on the pitch. However, being a female rugby player, that doesn't come without its inherent challenges. And so, you know, as a female rugby player coming through in Fiji, I've been through it in terms of the discrimination that we face, that rugby is not for girls, it's only for boys. We've been jeered at, we've had opportunities where we're threatened with violence, that we're spat at, that we're told to get back in the kitchen. And irrespective of all these different obstacles and challenges that we have faced, I'm grateful that I've gone through this. The reason being is because this has helped mold the person that I am today. So my journey as a rugby player and as the captain of the Fiji women's national team, I learned some valuable lessons that has helped me become successful in not only my academic, but my career as well. And I'd love to share with you all today these various lessons. One of them is grit. Grit to keep going when times get tough. Challenges will come, but guess what? That's part of the journey. Persevere, don't give up, because you don't want to spend the rest of your life asking what if. The next one is no excuses. How I live my life is I've got a no excuse policy. It doesn't matter how busy you are. We're all busy. If you have a goal, strive for it, right? You will make time, whether it's training, studies, um, a project that you have for work that you need to go and get done. Don't procrastinate. Just get the job done, no excuses. The next lesson I learned is having no fear. Don't fear because fear will only limit your life. Be bold, go forward, and isn't, if there isn't a road for you to follow, get out there and pave your own road. Next lesson was to be the best version of yourself in everything that you do. It's important to develop the different spheres that are shaping your life. And as a former athlete, one of the things that I notice is that as an athlete, we have such a narrow focus, which is to develop our sporting journey, focusing on the next game, focusing on the next match, the next competition, the next event. And what usually happens is we forget about the other spheres in our life, the academic um, side, careers, religion, and so forth. And so when our sporting career starts to fade, because as much as we love to play sports forever, time catches up and the whole body can't take it, but we need to shape these other spheres in our lives. So once one of the spheres goes to the wayside, the other spheres can lift us up. So <clears throat> when we're developing our different spheres, we have to do it to our best ability in everything that we do. At one stage, I was the general manager of Fiji's leading marine tourism organization. At the same time, I was representing my country on the world stage in rugby as the captain. And at the same time, I was pursuing my master's in business. In that year, I was honored to be awarded the Westpac Women in Business Executive Manager of the Year. And in addition to that, the Fiji Rugby Union Player of the Year. So my message is, if I can do it, you can too. No excuses. Next lesson was servitude of leadership. As a leader, we all know it's not about us. It's about taking on the responsibility to help others grow, to develop, to empower them to become successful. Because if we do this as a team, we are all going to be winners. And lastly, I know we always talk about being the change that we want to see in the world, but rise to the occasion. Look at what an ideal world would look like to you and how can you strive to be able to achieve that. Growing up, I didn't have role models that looked like me to be able to follow and aspire in their footsteps. And why is this? Lack of visibility? Is it the inherent fear of us as Pacific women where we opt to be humble rather than putting ourselves out there and confidently 
going forward and saying, yes, I'm ready to rise to the occasion? How can we break these barriers and change the situation around us if we continue to do this? We can't. We need to lead by example. We need to be the voice because as we know, a lot of our Pacific women, we're humble. They're, we don't want to speak up. So this is our opportunity to speak up and be the voice for others. And this is not just about championing, um, and this is all about championing our cause. In sport, in business, in media, whatever industry, we need to increase our visibility so that we can have other Pacific women being brilliant. This inspires other Pacific girls and women to follow in our high heels. It also normalizes the situation for our young boys to be able to look at women being successful across all industries in leadership and government roles. So it becomes the norm. And it also helps change the mindsets of our men to be more supportive of our daughters, our wives, our sisters, so that they too can become successful. So not only do we as women need to rise to the occasion and take on the responsibility to stand up, but the responsibility lies with each and every one of us to support our women to be brilliant. Panaka. You are so inspired, it's incredible. Thank you. Now, we've got about 10 minutes before we have to switch to Q&A, so I want to give the audience the time to put their hand up and ask their questions, but we're going to do another quick round uh, before we get there. And uh, Fiona, I know that uh, you've been working a lot on the regional gender equality policy. We've got, as Michael mentioned, we've got the, uh, the Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting coming up at the end of the month. Uh, you've just had a few weeks ago the, the uh, Pacific Women Leaders Meeting. You'll be taking the outcomes report to there. So can you just give a quick insight into the sorts of issues that they'll be taking to the meeting, please? Thank you. Yes. So um, as uh, Ambassador Corpus Campbell mentioned, we were in RMI last few weeks ago. Um, we had a week of our regional gender equality meetings. So we had the, the Triennial Conference for Women. We had the Pacific Ministers for Women uh, meeting and we had the Pacific Island Forum Women Leaders meeting. Um, the outcomes of the Triennial and the Ministers for Women um came to the Pacific Island Forum Women Leaders Meeting, um, and we've this will now be taken to our leaders. The PIF Women Leaders Meeting is a standing meeting of the forum. Um, key issues that were discussed, I think, if I can just speak to that week, were around women's economic empowerment. Um, the importance of data and research. Um, as part of this um, revitalized Pacific Leaders Gender Equality Declaration, we are developing a monitoring and evaluation and learning framework. Um, and we work closely with our member countries, um, Director Donina here, Samu, and other directors for women. Um, and so data, gender disaggregated data was really something that came up very uh, strongly in those discussions that week. And also looking at, um, again, gender-based violence um, and the new form of violence in terms of technology facilitated violence and how we can really work towards addressing these issues and of course um, women's um, leadership and I think just to the last point is that when we speak about women's leadership it's not just um, women's leadership at the political level but ensuring that we support women's leadership at all levels in our in our blue pacific so that's in in our communities, in our churches, in our clans, and in, in um, again, business and private sector, and support, supporting diverse women um, in our rural and, and remote and maritime communities, and also women with um, uh, disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Donina, we're going to turn to you again, and you've done a, a lot of work here in Australia. Would really love to hear about uh, your experience with the uh, the. Pacific Women's Professional and Business Network that you founded in Australia, uh, because we know that the aspirations of women are powerful drivers in, in uh, women's economic empowerment. So please tell us about that experience. Thank you. In, um, in a time that um, there was hotspots in certain areas, Western Sydney of um, Australia, uh, we found out and the Premise Department then established the New South Wales Council for Pacific Communities. 
Well, so that was good. Uh, there was a lot of still a lot of issues, and women actually wanted a space, a nurturing space, um, um, to get together. So in 2008, um, in a little daggy old um, restaurant, we gathered a few women there, and the seed of Pacific Women's Professional Business Network was then um, planted there. It wasn't in a born uh, a boardroom. It was in the hearts of the women that came together. What that was was actually well, we said established women, but really it was. Yeah, it was women who have walked through the doors and have, you know, established themselves, some um, successful. And the idea was that you are there and you want to give back to the community. Um, zero funding. Don't get me wrong. Funding is very important. But when you don't have it, what do you do? You need to continue. You need to find a way. So these women came together. And in 2017, we managed to um, establish the Pacific Women's Professional Business Network as an organization. Um, and what it is, is actually these women um, coming together, uh, connecting, and it's using our own connections to actually um, get women forward. For example, about um, a few years ago, there was a young woman that came to one of our little evening um, talks. Uh, uh, it's called Lay, Let's Empower and Inspire. And she was angry. She was angry with Sydney. She was angry with Australia. And she wanted to go back because she said she was um, has been abused, um, no hoper, um, no job, and she couldn't look after her parents. One week away from leaving um, Australia. What she wanted, we could all see that we could help her. So within the next two weeks, we managed to actually give her traineeships, three, four traineeships. Now, it also depends on the other person, right? She's a young 21-year-old, gave her four traineeships, three she couldn't get, which was only five minutes from home, but the fourth one was actually about two hours away. She chose to do it. 18 months, grit, indeed, grit. She went three trains, one bus, and we supported her, encouraged her. Today, she's a supervisor in Western Sydney at one of the child cares, completed her diploma. It's an amazing story. So it's, you know, we look at um, the Pacific Women's Professional Business Network. It's been around, still um, zero funded, but it's actually the heart of these women um, connecting and doing strategic partnerships with um, TAFE, with um, um, Department of Education, Premiers um, and Facts and Health. We tend to actually work very closely with the New South Wales government. Um, like, for example, during um, COVID-19 when it happened, um, Pacific Islands were seen as one high-risk um, um, communities and were able to bring together. PWN actually sought other Pacific organizations, brought them together. I was actually stuck in Samoa at the time, not allowed to come in, but I rallied everything from Samoa with our Pacific um, organizations here as well as um, the, the various um, ministry, Department of Health. So it's um, certainly, um, we didn't wait for anyone. We stood up and we just go, we keep going. That's yeah. great. Thank That's you. Great. Terrific story. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, Leilani, we're going to finish up with you. We're going to turn a little bit to your business side. Uh, what opportunities are there to get more women on boards? How can we get them, uh, get more women on boards and, and into CEO positions? Because we know how important that is sure. for the movement. So in my opinion, we definitely need to take a holistic approach, firstly, at an organisational level. At an organisational level, we need to adopt various strategies to help our women to succeed and step up into different board um, and leadership positions. And in doing so, everyone will reap the benefits of this. Some of the strategies that need to be adopted would be, one, creating personal development plans for our women, two, offering different mentoring programs and educational programs as we've seen in this wonderful case and the example by uh, my fellow panelists here, and also providing flexible working conditions for our women. Our women are mothers a lot of the time. We need to be able to have the consideration and provide them with the opportunities for them to succeed whilst they're looking after their at-home duties. Also, in some cases, quotas could probably be implemented as well. In addition to this, it is also up to our women, and I talked about it a little bit briefly to start with. It's up to us to have credentialed female professionals to take that step forward. We always talk about our Pacific women as being humble. They are scared to speak up and say, I can do this, I am accredited, I have got the experience to step up into these positions because one, they're scared of being ridiculed. Okay, so we need to believe in ourselves as women to have the confidence in our own abilities. We also need to make sure that when we're getting into these positions, that we're making impactful, um, making an impact 
that we are the best person for the job there, irrespective of our gender. And finally, it's so important that we have male or female advocates that are championing these women and being the voice for these women when they're not into the room. Naka. Thank you. Well, Ambassador, we've heard a lot from these uh, inspiring women. I'd love to hear your reflections on what they've talked about tonight, but also uh, from a, a comment that the Marshall Islands President, Dr Hilda, Hilda Heine, made at the 15th Triennial Conference of Pacific Women. She said that in terms of advancing gender equality, we may, must take risks and create new partnerships. So if you could reflect on that comment and, and on the comments made tonight, that would be great. So I think the first thing I would say that gender equality is not just a nice thing to have. It is absolutely essential. If we leave behind 50% of the population, and indeed if we don't tap into the talent and brain power of 100% of the population, we're not going to have peace and security. We're not going to address poverty. We're not going to address climate change. Um, we are in trouble if we don't have gender equality. So I, I think that's the first really important point. I think, secondly, we can reflect that we've made great progress. I look when I started in my various roles 30 years ago, um, where we were then and where we are now, we've heard some examples. We've made progress, but we cannot assume that progress is linear. There are many countries in this world, and um country I'm from might also provide an example where granddaughters have less rights than their grandmothers. So we can't rest on our laurels and assume that we don't have to fight and work for gender equality every single day. And we have some new challenges. We had setback after COVID and we still haven't got on top of that. Um, we have new challenges, the intensification of climate change and the disproportional effect on women and girls. Um, we have active pushback that we're seeing right across the world and we're seeing in the region. And we have new forms of violence like technology facilitated violence, which is actively pushing women out of public spaces and undermining democracy. And we were talking um, earlier about who would want to go into politics if you're a woman. Um, it's really, really difficult. So with all of these things, we do need to continue to address things like social norms. Um, men take charge, women take care. We need to shake that up. We need to address it. We need to, and we've heard it here and, and we heard it at our um, meetings in RMI, we must engage men and boys in a positive way as part of this journey. It's worrying what's happening to young men at the moment, right throughout the world. You look at some of the research coming out of... Um, King's College London, our own country out of Melbourne Uni recent, uh, recently, and there's something happening with our young men. They're becoming um, um, less tolerant of gender equality than their own fathers. We need men as allies. We need men as partners. We need men as part of the solution. Gender equality is not about women. It's about every single person having every single opportunity to meet their full potential regardless of their gender, and it's good for men, it's good for women, it's good for girls, it's good for everyone in all of their diversity. So I think we, we heard that today. We're making progress. We can't stop. We can't assume it's linear, and the world's going to be a much better place when everyone can participate. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, we are running a little bit behind time, but we do want to give you enough time to ask questions, so we'll, we'll give you about 10 minutes. I'd like to open it up to the floor, and if we can keep the questions brief, please, uh, and no comments, that would be absolutely terrific. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm from Samoa. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm from Samoa, so really uh, awesome to have this uh, uh, group of panelists, very professional and experienced, and uh, thank you for sharing your uh, knowledge uh, with us today, tonight. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate the uh, note about progress, and that's great. It's really awesome that we, uh, I think a lot, a lot across the region, we have made really good progress compared to like 1970s, a lot of questions about what is gender equality. We don't need that in the region. So very good progress so far and in different fields. Rugby, 
uh, sports, in business, and uh, politics, and, and other aspects of development. So really, uh, I think our, sorry, it's a long, long question, but I'll come to my question um, very soon. The, <laughs> the thing to remember, I think, uh, is, is to uh, know the intersectional nature of gender equality that we also need to look into, you know, I'm sure you know, women with disability, young women with disability, older women with disability, non-binary youth with disability, non-binary adults with disability, uh, hard to reach uh, populations. So we are getting a bit more uh, complex. The picture is more complex these days, but the effort is there, which is great. Um, I'm seeing a grandmother, Pacific grandmother, most likely someone carrying, uh, you know, a bag of fruits and things going to the market, uh, also carrying lots of, you know, trying to drag the rest of the grandchildren with her. So you got, you know, gender equality, of course, women are winning uh, in some areas, uh, but you also have a lot of other issues to baggage and stuff to, to pay attention to as well. My question. Um, to Dr. Hukula, the uh, point about uh, women in business, in business, and there are certainly women in the Pacific who are doing, uh, starting their small businesses, but they just don't want to, you know, go have, make it big, just enough to, you know, support the families, put the kids to school. My question is, um, in that particular, for that particular group of women from your work and experience, what, what kinds of support are we giving them? Um, because they, they just don't want to go up the next level and register a business and, and all that. But so there might, it seems to be a gap for me anyway. I did a bit of research on, on that particular sort of area, but just wondering what, what the forum secretariat or other organizations are doing for that specific group of women. Afitai. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think, and that's a really good question, just very quickly, and I will draw from my previous experience as a, as a researcher in PNG who's done some work in the informal economy. I think the key thing with supporting these, uh, this group of women is to ensure that we have the enabling environment for them to be able to um, to, to thrive in the informal economy. So I'm speaking about the market mamas, the, the women who sell in the vegetable, vegetable market, the fish markets. And so, um, that kind of environment means having a safe space where there's opportunities to uh, provide, um, spaces for their children, having just the basic things, ensuring that there's, um, washrooms. Um, and I think, um, there's some great examples from the RMI, but again from PNG, where financial institutions can support these women through them. We have the um, the Mama Bank in PNG that um, works to support this group of women. So I think um, from the, at the Secretariat, this is where we again look at where there's opportunities to support women at all different levels, um, including those um, in the informal economy and really just strengthening the environment that they work in. Thanks. Thank you, Fiona. I think we had a question down the front. Did you still want to ask a question? Uh, you said something that really struck me, and that was um, gender equality enhances women's role as carers, and it doesn't diminish it. Could you just briefly expand on that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was referring to how um, in, in the Pacific, our role as um, mothers, as nurturers, as carers, you know, and often with um, gender equality and then this is new sort of wave of thinking that, well, you know, if that's the case, then I shouldn't be home. Then it, there's sort of like now this increase in um, coming forward from the men saying, oh, the women don't want to wash the dishes because they're saying that 50-50. You wash 50, I wash the other 50%, that kind of, um, you know, and, and it's increasing. So it's actually really, um, and, and we, you know, I'm stressing that um, back at home, but also here in, um, in Australia. 
and something that I learned very much from my mentor here in Australia as well. It doesn't mean that um, gender equality is not about this 50-50 at home in the kitchen. We were born as um, women to actually carry the child. Their first is actually us. And that's what I mean. It doesn't diminish that. In fact, um, the better you are in gender equality, the better it is at the work that you do at home. And remembering that you're actually uh, bringing up your sons as well. And in fact, I wanted to mention that, that early childhood development is key to this. Because if you can actually build that foundation from there, then we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. So it actually should enhance you as a mom and, and, and what you do at home. I will still go back and wash my dishes and do my washing. <laughs> Thanks, Donina. We have a question down here, and uh, we might have to wrap it up soon. We have one up there. Are there any men in the audience who want to ask a question? I might add that um, <laughs> it's okay if you want to. We we do have, I've heard some terrific stories about the male champions in their life as well, and that's been a really important part of the story. We do hear how important it is to have men on the journey, but there are some really terrific men that are on this journey as well, here in Australia as well. There's uh, Julius Tui Gamala running Pacificast up in Sydney. He's done a terrific job setting up a, a um, women's soccer tournament that ran for six weeks, allowed the mums to play soccer while the men were all feeding food at the stalls, the Pacific stalls, really great initiatives like that. So. There are some really terrific men, male champions in here, but please, your question. Hi, thanks. Um, this question is probably best directed towards Ambassador Copas Campbell. Um, today we've talked a lot about gender equality and a lot of projects and programs centering on gender equality, but we know that equality or equal access to opportunities is not the same as achieving gender equity or equity. Um, and I was kind of just wondering, is there any scope when we evaluate or look at these projects and programs to consider equity as well as equality and how do you think this could add value or add benefit? So I love that cartoon that has, uh, you've probably seen it, where you have um, everyone trying to look over a fence, you know the one I'm talking about, and they're all equal. So some people can see over the fence and some people can't, right? And so you need to make the stools a little bit higher and that's equity. So I would say specifically in everything that we do, we want to have equality so everyone should have the same opportunity, but also recognising at times we, and, and I like to look at it that we are all about also removing barriers. So we look across gender equality and we think, who has the, the greatest barriers to any one thing and how do we at times, you know, make sure there's an equal playing field and at times people might need a little bit more of a step up. So there may be a focus in certain sectors on ensuring um, that we might be supporting some thinking about quotas, for example, in politics where you can ensure that you get more women into to parliaments, for example, if that's what, you know, the priority of a country is. So I, I would think in everything that we do, we're certainly looking at equality but equity is also part of that because at the end of the day, you want everyone to be able to, to benefit um, as well. And just back to a previous question on or comment that you made on, on intersectionality, I also think that's a really important point in all that we do. And I was reflecting as you were talking, I was in a, a meeting, I, I used to work in a very male-dominated sector in the private sector, and it, I was in the room with myself and there was an, another woman who was in a wheelchair and there was a man at the table who said something he shouldn't have said. None of the men noticed. We both looked at each other and said, really? And afterwards, I said to her, I said, I'm so tired of being a woman in this room full of men, and they're saying these things, and they don't recognize it, and I'm just sick of it. And she said, yep, I'm sick of it too. But she said, Steph, I want you to know, when I go into these rooms, I have every single issue that you have being a woman of men. But at the same time, I have to worry about how am I going to get to the toilet? Are people going to look at me and think just because your legs aren't working very well, there's something wrong with your brain? You know, on and on that she had this additional layer of things she had to think about all of the time. And that just, that hit me in terms of intersectionality. And that hit me in terms of how we need to ensure in everything we do, equality. But we're also thinking about the various challenges that people have based on how they identify sexually, how they um, live or, or not with a disability, their age, whether they're rural or urban, et cetera. And it's just a, a really important point in all that we do. So thank you um, for raising that as well.
Thank you, Ambassador. Look, we are going to have to wrap it up there now. I encourage you, I know that there's some more questions to be asked, so please come up and ask them at the in the networking function afterwards. Um, I'm going to pass over to Michael, um, but firstly, I just want to quote the Foreign Minister. She just mentioned uh, the reasons for optimism. These four women on this stage are our reasons for optimism, absolutely driving uh, uh, women's uh, empowerment in the Pacific. Um, and there are three things that I've picked up tonight, uh, respect, grit and perseverance. I think I'm going to need all of those next year in Parliament House. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Let me just um, repeat what Jess said. I thought it was a, a fabulous discussion from Stephanie, Fiona, Donina, Leilani and Jess a really encouraging, positive discussion, um, full of anecdotes. The one that you told about um, the young woman who took the difficult traineeship that turned out to be the right traineeship for her that that um, that uh, led to those changes in her life was something that I'll remember. And I, I will also think about Stephanie's remark, and, and that is that we we need to tap into 100% of the world's brain power in order to achieve peace and security, to deal with climate change and to meet all the other challenges that the Lowy Institute works on. So let me, on behalf of everybody in the audience, uh, as well as thanking the Foreign Minister Penny Wong, let me say thank you. Thank you, True, for Afatai and Vinaka. Thank you very much. <laughs> And after that, after that, I think we deserve a celebratory drink and there are drinks in the room next door, so please join us there. Thank you all for coming.